When looking at a familiar passage of scripture, such as today's Old Testament passage out of 1 Samuel 3, it's tempting to assume we already know the story, especially if you've either been in Sunday school as a young child or a Sunday school teacher. It's the call of Samuel, the fourth time he finally gets it. And therefore, it's tempting to shift our minds into neutral and assuming that this morning we will simply rehearse what we already know, or at least what we think we know. Old Testament theologian Ellen Davis reminds us the following, quote, it's a peculiarly modern conceit to assume that we might ever know fully what God has to say to us through the scriptures. Ancient and medieval interpreters regarded it as impossible to ever plumb that wondrous depth and exhaust all its treasures, unquote. And so as we pray together this morning, let us do so conscious of Augustine's mira profundis, the idea that the waters in creation were not so deep as the word of God that delivers that creation. And let's pray for that same spirit that hovered over the tohu vabohu in Genesis 1 to come in power and grant us sight and insight into this familiar passage of scripture. So let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are enthroned in glory and majesty, and yet you are also full of kindness and compassion, and you've reached down to us in our smallness and our sinfulness in your Son, Jesus Christ. And you've promised to accept us through your Son, but not only to accept us, but to bless us with grace upon grace. And so we come this morning, Father, in all our need, so much of which is hidden from each other and even from ourselves. But you know us through and through, and we ask that your spirit would come and bring your word to bear on each one of us in our particular circumstance. Give us hearts to be willing to listen, to be molded by your spirit. We ask that you'd speak for your servants are listening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I'm going to have to take this off. I'm having a hard time reading. So I guess that's okay with this here. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 3. I encourage you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. It's a passage about transition. It recounts the call of Samuel during the tail end of the period of that tumultuous, dark age that we call the period of the judges, when there's no king in Israel and everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. The people of Israel had repeatedly ignored the word of the Lord. Godliness was at a low ebb. Now, in the second chapter of 1 Samuel, we find that the sons of Eli the priest, Hophni and Phinehas, priests themselves, are corrupt, and they abuse their positions of power. They took a potluck approach to the sacrificial meat offerings, forcing worshipers into relinquishing part of those offerings for their own personal benefit, refusing the, to take the portions assigned to them by the Levitical law. We also discover that these two sons had sexual relations with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Instead of faithfully preaching God's word to the people, Eli's sons act like scoundrels committing moral and liturgical offenses with impunity. And Eli's response? He indulges his sons. Yes, we're told in chapter 2 that he rebuked them for their moral offenses, but he took no action to expel Hophni and Phinehas from their priestly office. Eli might protest, but his sons suffered no unemployment. At the same time, throughout chapter 2, amidst this recounting of the sins of Hophni and Phinehas, there's this quiet drumbeat contrasting the faithful service of Samuel in the tabernacle. So we read in chapter 2, verse 18, But Samuel was ministering before the Lord. 
in verse 21. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. In verse 26, and the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Now, you may remember Samuel's mother, Hannah, after she had weaned him, brought him to the temple in Shiloh in fulfillment of the vow that she had made to the Lord. And there Samuel served as Eli's assistants. Assistant. So our passage opens today, and at the outset of chapter 3, we're told that in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Two things are in short supply. The Lord's not giving his word except in rare instances. Now, one of those rare instances happens to be at the end of chapter 2, where this unnamed prophet is raised up to declare judgment on the house of Eli. But the word of the Lord is rare, and so are visions. Yet we know that the Lord's heart is for his people to have his word. It's his gift to his people, and at the tail end of the period of the judges, it was seldom given. Earlier on in Israel's history, the Lord had spoken frequently with Moses face to face, but at this time, there is no prophet like Moses. Why the divine silence? Well, in the Old Testament, often a dearth of God's word was an expression of God's judgment. For example, years later, when the Lord through the prophet Amos pronounces judgment on the northern kingdom for continued apostasy, the judgment took the form of a famine. But it wasn't a famine of bread and water, but according to Amos 8, a famine of hearing the word of God. So also, Psalm 74 paints this picture of the southern kingdom withering under the Lord's judgment as the temple is destroyed and there's no longer any prophet to proclaim the word of the Lord. The Lord withdraws the light of his word, allowing his people to wander in the darkness they so desperately prefer. Proverbs 19.18 warns us, where there is no revelation, where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. And that's what's been happening in the 300 or so years of the period of the judges. A word from the Lord is desperately needed. But a word from the Lord cannot be coerced or manipulated or manufactured. It's a gift that only the Lord can give to his people. And here in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, the Lord indeed graciously breaks in with a fresh word. And we have this transition into this new era in which the prophetic office is established. The Lord breaks his silence. His voice rings out because in his mercy, he has not forgotten his people. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. We don't know how old Samuel is. He's been growing. And in verse 1 here, he's referred to as a na'ar. Now, the Hebrew word na'ar is a very flexible word. It can refer to an infant a few days old, but Solomon uses it to refer to himself when he's 40 years old. So it's quite flexible. But according to Jewish tradition, Samuel is 12 years old at this time. And as we said, he's Eli's assistant. Now, in verse 2, we're told that Eli is unable to see well. Physically, his eyes have become very weak. But in addition to his physical impairment, the old priest is also slow to perceive spiritual truth. Remember back in chapter 1, he was initially unable to discern godly Hannah's plight. He passed her off as a worthless, drunken woman. And as we'll see in chapter 3, it takes him quite a while to discern that it's the Lord calling Samuel. He doesn't get it until the third time around. Samuel is sleeping somewhere in the confines of the tabernacle near the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Hebrew word in verse 3, maybe that startled you when the passage was read uh, that Samuel was lying in the temple. And indeed, the Hebrew word there is hekal, which we translate temple or palace. 
what's going on? It's the days of the judges. Well, what scholars think is that the Israelites erected some sort of semi-permanent structure to go around the portable tabernacle. And Samuel is there ministering to Eli at this time. And we're told in verse 3 that the lamp of the Lord had not yet gone out. Torah instruction required that the lamp be lit from dusk to dawn each day, so it's probably early dawn. The lamp of the Lord had not yet gone out. And in the inimitable words of the popular 60s folk rock theologians, the mamas and the papas, the darkest hour is just before dawn. So it's in this darkness of this early dawn that the Lord breaks into the spiritual darkness that's engulfed his people and he calls the boy Samuel. And Samuel mistakes the call of the Lord for that of Eli. Now, in one sense, it's only natural for Samuel to assume that a call in the early morning comes from his master Eli. Perhaps the old priest needs a cup of water or some other assistance from the lad. So Samuel runs to Eli's quarters. Here I am, for you called me. And Eli responds, I didn't call you. Go lie down. This exchange is repeated two more times, and it's not until the third time that Eli realizes that it's the Lord calling Samuel. And so he says to the boy, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Why was Samuel so slow on the uptake in recognizing that it was the voice of the Lord calling him? Well, we noted that the passage begins by telling us that a word from the Lord was rare in those days. But even more so, look with with me at verse 7. In between the second and third call of the Lord, we read in verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now, back in 2.12, we're told the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Was Samuel just like the sons of Eli? No, Hophni and Phinehas did not want to know the Lord. You cannot repeatedly and high-handedly defy the Lord and know him simultaneously. Samuel had been characterized in contrast to Eli's sons as faithfully ministering in the tabernacle. True enough, but you see, parental, neither parental consecration nor liturgical competence can substitute for personally hearing the word of the Lord. And despite the fact that Samuel had been faithfully ministering and participating in tabernacle affairs, He had not yet had a direct experience with the Lord. The difference between Samuel and Eli's sons is in the little word yet. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. He was on unfamiliar ground, but that was about to change. So this description implies a different future for him in contrast to that for Hophni and Phinehas. Soon Samuel would know the Lord. And by the way, do you see the kindness and the patience of the Lord here in his dealings with Samuel? There's no sense throughout this narrative that the Lord is exasperated with Samuel. There's no berating of the boy. There's no, when's he going to get that it's me who's calling him? There's no sense that the fourth call would be the Lord's last attempt with Samuel, four strikes and you're out. What a gracious, long-suffering God we serve. And then finally in verse 10, we read that the Lord came and stood there, calling as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel, Samuel, that double vocative, echoing the Lord's endearing call to his great servants of the past. Abraham, Abraham. Moses, Moses, and now Samuel, Samuel, ushering in this new era in which the Lord will raise up prophets as his spokespersons 
proclaiming his word to his people. Samuel in deference simply responds, speak for your servant hears. And so with the call of Samuel comes an end of the drought of divine silence and appearance as the Lord comes and stands. This is a theophany going on here and speaks to the boy Samuel. And the word the Lord speaks to him is a difficult word. It's a difficult word to hear, and it's an even more difficult word for Samuel to speak, for Samuel is to pronounce imminent judgment on Eli and his house, a severe judgment that, according to verse 11, will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle in dismay. By the end of chapter 3, Samuel is no longer subservient to Eli, and the entire nation from Dan to Beersheba has recognized Samuel as a true prophet of the Lord and as the one in whom Israel's destiny for the future is vested. We know the rest of the story. Samuel is in many respects a successful judge, prophet, and priest. He's also a successful military leader, He establishes the office of kingship in Israel, and he anoints and deposes kings as the Lord commands him to, and he's a faithful intercessor on behalf of the nation. But towards the end of his life, we read in 2 Samuel 8 that the corruption of his own sons ironically mimics that of Eli. Our passage began with the notice, in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions, followed by the account of the Lord's grace and faithfulness as he broke in once again uh, to proclaim his word and establish this new era of prophetic proclamation. God's heart is for his people to have his word. There would come another extended period of divine silence with no prophetic activity. That 400-year period of silence between the closing of the Older Testament and the dawning of the New, what we call the intertestamental period. But this extended dearth of divine communication would not be interrupted by the call of yet another faithful but limited servant but rather by the promise breaking in of God's own son, the eternal word, the word of God incarnate, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, it's easy to look around today and observe a lot of striking similarities between our day and Samuel's in the sense that as the Christian narrative continues to recede from our public conscience and consciousness here in the West, It's being replaced with moral confusion and chaos, with people casting off restraint and everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. And it's easy or tempting to become frustrated and anxious and despondent. But this is not the period of the judges. Think of what the author of Hebrews has told us. God, after he spoke long ago, to the fathers and the prophets in many forms and in many ways in these last days has spoken to us and we are in Jesus Christ, through whom he appointed, he made heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And the message of the eternal word this morning, the gospel message read in Matthew 9, wasn't that there's a dearth of God's word. There isn't. The harvest is plentiful. Pray for laborers. That's what's for you. Dear friends, the kingdom of God is on the move. I wish we had a full chapel here for lots of reasons, but one is because I could look around at all the individuals that in the last few years have trotted around the globe to see all the wonderful things that the Lord is doing throughout the world. His kingdom is advancing. Aslan is on the move. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. I think of some of my own trips. Just a year ago, Grant and I were in Kenya. And again, in the midst of poverty, to see the word of God spreading and to see how busy our graduates are ministering to multiple churches. 
Or in March, I had the opportunity of going to Lahore, Pakistan, and seeing the amazing work, how the kingdom of God is advancing in a country where Christianity is basically illegal. We are not in the period of the judges. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jesus is drawing many to himself today in Muslim countries through visions and dreams. The kingdom of God is advancing. Aslan is on the move. You know, I suspect most of us are here because we answered the call. We heard the Lord and we said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. But that's not a one and done. It's not, okay, great, I'm an Old Testament professor and that's, that's what I do till I die. This needs to be a constant posture of our heart, asking the Lord, where am I to go? Many of you are in the discernment process, some at the beginning, some closer to the end. May this be a constant drumbeat in our prayers. Lord, what would you have me to do? So let us pray in response to Jesus' command. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out uh, workers into the harvest. And may we be willing to be the answer to that prayer. May we always say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.